is Sunday afternoon, May 15, 2005, and time for the Money Show. Almost a whole hour of talking about money, the economy, your savings, your investments, anything having to do with the green stuff. And this is your host, Harry Brown. I'll be here for the rest of this hour. And if so, I'm here to answer your questions, or at least to tell you I don't know the answer. Oh, and occasionally to maybe give you some help. So if you have a question about investing or the economy or how something works in the economy, uh, just fire away. Or if you just want to make a comment about something that's going on, we're be, we'll be glad to hear anything you have to say. The phone number is one 800 259-9231 Today I can't take your email question unfortunately because as you've already figured out by now I'm not in my studio in Nashville I'm on the road and so I'm talking over a regular telephone line and so I'm in a situation where I don't have all my equipment with me and all my facilities so you're just going to have to get over your shyness and call me instead of sending me an email. And I think we will begin with a few questions that have come in during the week that may be of interest to most people listening to this show. First question is from Greg out in cyberspace who says, is there a great economic inference that we should make from the Fed's recent talk about reissuing the 30-year treasuries? All right, here's the background for those who don't know. It used to be that the Federal Reserve issued bonds up to a length of 30 years in duration, meaning a bond that would not be repaid, the principal would not be repaid for 30 years. In fact, let's go back a little bit further. The Treasury finances all of this government debt, which now amounts to somewhere around $7 trillion or so, at least that's the nominal debt. There are a whole lot of unfunded liabilities also, meaning promises that the government has made to pay in the future that it has set no money aside for. But just the absolute debt that exists right now, you have over $7 trillion. And the Treasury Department finances this with three types of Treasury securities. One is the Treasury bill, which is anything up to one year in length when it's issued. In other words, uh, tomorrow morning the Treasury might issue a bill that will mature, meaning it will be repaid on May 15th of next year. Or it might issue one that's going to be repaid in 90 days. Uh, which would be, what, uh, August 15th of this year. And it has various Treasury bills that it issues of varying lengths. Then there are Treasury notes, which are uh, IOUs of the government that will be repaid sometime within one year and ten years from the time they're issued. In other words, if the Treasury were to issue one tomorrow, put it out on the, on the market for people to finance, it would be repaid uh it would it would have a due date on it that might be two years from now, it might be six years from now, it might be ten years from now, but somewhere between one and ten years. Then finally, you have treasury bonds, and those uh, bonds of course are securities that will be repaid sometime between 10 years from now and 30 years from now, or at least it used to be 30 years was the maximum. And it used to be that the Treasury would issue a new 30-year bond in February, and then it would issue a new 30-year bond in August of every year. And those bonds then are, on the, when they're taken by people, in other words, people put up the money, buy the bonds, which is like providing a loan to the Treasury, the Treasury would then pay interest on the bond twice each year, usually again in February and August. And it would mean that you would get in February half of what the interest was that was promised for the year. So if you had a 10% bond uh, and you had a, a $1,000 face value of the bond, then the Treasury would owe you $100 a year in interest, and you'd get $50 of that in February and $50 in August. And then at the end of the period of the bond, you'd get the original $1,000 back as well. Well, back in 2001, 
just after the Bush administration took over, it decided that it was going to save a little money by no longer issuing 30-year bonds. And for the life of me, for the life of me, I cannot understand how they figured they were going to save money by not issuing 30-year bonds. Yes, it is true that the longer the time to maturity in general, that the higher the interest rate would be. But interest rates were already low, and they were getting lower. And now here we have treasury bonds that carry a yield on them of only four and three quarters percent a year. This would be the ideal time to be issuing 30-year bonds. Most people expect interest rates to rise. That doesn't mean they will, but just assuming that they assume that interest rates are going to rise, why wouldn't they want to lock in that low interest rate for 30 years? Why not issue a, a bond a day for four and three quarter percent, and then three years or five years from now, when bonds are yielding six percent, they can all slap themselves on the backs and say, "Wow, aren't we smart? Look what we did. We locked in this four and three quarter percent interest rate because all the interest rates are fixed. They're not like adjustable mortgage rates or credit card rates that go up and down." Once the interest rate is established at the outset, that's what it is for the whole time. Well, finally, what has happened is that the Treasury Department has announced that it's considering, not doing, but considering reissuing 30-year Treasury bonds in February 2006. And the decision will be announced on August 3rd. I think it would be a very good thing, not just for the Treasury, but for us as investors if this happens. Now, as you know, I like the idea of a permanent portfolio, a portfolio that has stocks, bonds, gold, and cash in it, and the bonds should be as long a maturity as possible. First of all, they should be Treasury bonds so that you don't have any credit risk because the Treasury can print and tax whatever it needs to repay the principal and interest. But it would be nice if you could have 30-year bonds because the longer the time to maturity, the more powerful the bond is. That means as if interest rates drop, that the bond will have a bigger increase in value from the drop in interest rates than it would have if it was a 10-year bond or a 15-year bond. And it's not so bad that the longest bond right now is 26 years to maturity, but if it kept on that way, that they kept uh, the never issued a bond later uh, to uh, mature than 2031, which is that 26-year bond now, and it got down to 24 years, 22 years, 20 years, then uh, we would be hard-pressed to find something to cover the bond portion of the portfolio. So I do hope they announce that they will once again start issuing 30-year bonds. So to answer Greg's question, is there a great economic inference we should make from the recent Fed talk about it reissuing the 30-year treasuries? Number one, it means somebody in the Treasury Department has wised up. And number two, it's good for us as investors, at least those of us who like the permanent portfolio concept. And I hope you do, and I hope we, we will be talking about that more during the rest of the show, but I'll give you some more questions and answers when we come back from the break. But you can call me at 1-800-259-9231. This is The Money Show with Harry Brown, and it's sponsored in part by the Permanent Portfolio Family of Funds. And we'll be right back, so don't go away. This is Harry Brown. Have you lost money in stocks over the past few years? From 2000 through 2002, the stock market lost a third of its value. But during those three years, a bulletproof portfolio gained 9%. And over the past 34 years, such a portfolio gained an average of over 9% per year throughout periods of prosperity, inflation, and recession, with no wide swings in value. My book, Failsafe Investing, shows how you can have that kind of portfolio for yourself. And now you can download the book for only $9.75. You don't have to rely on alleged market wizards or stay up late worrying about your savings. Failsafe Investing will show you how to have the security that you crave. 
Go to LibertyFree.com to see a sample chapter of Fail Safe Investing and then start protecting the savings you've worked so hard to acquire. That's LibertyFree.com. Welcome back. This is Harry Brown. The phone number is 1-800-259-9231. And we have a question from Olivier that came in during the week by email. And he says, this line of argument comes back often in response to people's fear of a given corporation or bank cornering the market of oil, operating systems, gold, etc., and then you, meaning me, Harry Brown, then mentioned that such a corporation or bank cannot be larger than the market. I must admit I am not grasping the sense of that concept. Would you mind explaining it another way to bolster one's arguments against the fear of monopolies? Well, thank you for the question. Um, a week or two or so ago, somebody called in and was afraid about corporations cornering the market and felt that they could be just as... Uh, difficult for us, uh, just as much a problem as government is, but the difference, of course, is that government has guns. Government can use force to uh, make sure that you do whatever it wants you to do. And I said that no corporation can do that because no corporation is bigger than the market. And it also came up with regard to uh, such things as cornering some market, uh, that somebody could corner the market and run the price up, uh, whether we're talking about an investment price or the price of a commodity or whatever it might be. Well, here's, here's one way to look at it. You've undoubtedly seen a Western movie where the cattle ranchers uh, or somebody like that has a hold on the town and everybody's in fear of the cattle rancher and so on. And then into the town comes Clint Eastwood or somebody like that. And the, or maybe it's Shane. Yeah, it's got to be Shane. Anyway, the people who are being oppressed, uh, hire Shane or Clint Eastwood or whoever it is, hire him to, uh, protect them, to take care of them, to, to solve this problem for them. And because he knows how somehow to solve this problem, he takes care of it for them. Now, that's kind of an extreme example, and it's one that involves guns, and we don't need to talk about the guns, but it's really the same thing in the real world, that any time that there is a big problem that is facing any number of people, any substantial number of people, then there's going to be somebody who knows how to solve it, and that person is going to be able to make a very tidy profit by solving it for people. Now, the problem can be any one of many different kinds. It can be that some uh, corporation has bought up all of its competitors and now has the market supposedly cornered and is raising the prices. Incidentally, such a thing has never happened in the history of the United States of America, but people always talk as though it did, that it happened uh, with the oil companies back at the start of the 1900s and other things like that, and they always raise this as this terrible, terrible thing that could happen, even though it's never as yet happened, for all I know, in the history of the world, but certainly in the history of the United States. But suppose it did happen. Well, there are bound to be other people who know how to get that product to market, and they wouldn't have bothered doing so, but now the price is so high, uh, they can make a huge profit by selling to people who uh, simply cannot afford that high price and want to get the pr uh, product at a smaller price. Well, let's take another situation. Suppose... There's no regulation of banks whatsoever, and some banks are failing, and nobody knows whether any of the banks are safe. Well, somebody knows how to figure out whether the banks are safe just by reading the bank statements or getting inside information or doing something, and that person is going to be able to make a tidy profit by providing that information to the public. And if people need the information, somebody's going to be there to get it. And it doesn't matter what the need is. It may be a problem of insecurity. It may be a problem of prices being too high. It may be a problem of service not being good. Whatever it is, 
is. It's an opportunity for somebody to make a profit. And so the result of that is always that somebody's going to come into the market provided there is there is one provision in this, one proviso, provided the government is not keeping those other competitors out by force. When the government establishes a monopoly, whether it's its own monopoly or simply protecting the monopoly of some private company, then it can force everyone else to stay out of the market under penalty of heavy fines or imprisonment, and then you really do have a monopoly, and then you really do have a problem. And that happens frequently. Water companies, uh, electric companies, cable companies throughout the United States are almost all monopolies that have been granted by the government, where the government says over this particular geographical area, there will be only one company that can supply the electricity, only one company that can supply the water, only one company that can supply a cable TV. And they may be private companies, but they are protected by the government. And when they're protected by the government, then, of course, they say, well, the government has to set the price. You can't just let them charge anything because they don't have any competitors. And the government has to establish rules for service and so forth. So what you have is a bunch of politicians deciding what they think people ought to have rather than the people themselves being able to pick and choose among companies and get what they want uh, because companies will be trying to please them. So uh, in the absence of a government-granted monopoly, there just really is no such thing as a private monopoly. Microsoft is not a monopoly. General Motors is not a monopoly. Standard Oil is not a monopoly. There is no company that exists in this country that you absolutely have to buy it from. Now, there's another way in which we say that nobody is bigger than the market, and that is with regard to setting the prices of things. I think that's the uh, concept that came up a week ago when uh, I think somebody was talking about uh, setting the gold price. Well, governments can't set the gold price. Governments can't keep currency prices at any given point, uh, at any given rate for any particular length of time. They can do it in the short term, but in the long term, all they do is to make the swing in price much steeper and much more drastic at a given time rather than letting the price adjust naturally over a period of time, naturally and gradually. But my point is that there is nobody that's big enough to control the whole market in the, in the world for any commodity or anything else. And as a result, uh, prices continue to move around despite the wishes of producers to keep them high or consumers to keep them low. And we do get a great deal of interference in the market, creating artificial situations for short terms. But in the long run, nobody is bigger than the market, and the price will always eventually reflect the real supply and demand situation. I hope that helps. If it doesn't, let me know, and we'll try another way to look at it. Well, we have a question from Daryl in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I'm going to get to that just as soon as we come back from this break. This is The Money Show with Harry Brown, and it's sponsored in part by the Permanent Portfolio Family of Funds Seeking Safety and Stability. So stay tuned. We still have a half hour to go, and your question can be answered at 1-800-259-9231. We'll be right back. This is Harry Brown. My book, Fail Safe Investing, will tell you what you need to know to create your own bulletproof investment portfolio, one that will protect you whatever the future brings, prosperity, inflation, recession, even depression, and it will protect you without your having to predict the future or tinker with the portfolio. Best news of all, at libertyfree.com, you can download the book for only $9.75. That's right, just nine seventy five. You can read the book on your computer screen or print it out and read it in your easy chair. If you're tired of losing money on your investments, tired of the pressure of looking for the best investments, here's the way to have your own bulletproof portfolio, no matter how big or small your savings. To get a free sample chapter from Fail Safe Investing, just go to libertyfree.com right now. 
That's libertyfree.com. Well, welcome back. This is Harry Brown. And now for that question from Daryl in Knoxville, Tennessee. He says, do you recommend investing money in a Roth IRA for retirement versus investing in gold? I know the stock market isn't doing well, and our dollar is very, very weak. Well, we have uh, two or three questions wrapped up here in this one. And, of course, the first one has to do with the question of the Roth IRA versus investing in gold. Uh, I think there may be a little misunderstanding there. A Roth IRA is not an investment. An IRA is not an investment. A 401k plan is not an investment. These are ways of holding investments so that you can defer the tax on them until you retire. But they are not investments themselves. They are receptacles for investments. It's like a brokerage account or a bank account where you can hold certain things in that brokerage or bank account, such as bonds or stocks or something else. And it is, as I say, not an investment itself. So it's really not a Roth IRA versus investing in gold. The question is, should you have a Roth IRA and should you invest in gold? Two separate questions. Let's start with the Roth IRA. Obviously, anything you can do to defer taxes uh, to a later point in time is always better. It's, uh, it's almost as simple a question as, do you want to live longer? And the answer is always yes. And the answer is always yes, that if you can defer taxes to a later date, you want to do so. Why? Because, first of all, which it's almost like getting a tax-free, uh, pardon me, like getting an interest-free loan. Uh, you don't have to pay the government until some later time. And in the meantime, you get to use that money. And that money, we hope, will grow through investments, through savings, through interest, uh, dividends, uh, capital gains, whatever, that the money will be working for you, money that otherwise would be in the hands of the Treasury. So it's always well to use any tax-deferred plan that is available to you. Some people don't have tax-deferred plans available to them, and that's unfortunate. But if you can get your hands on any, then so much the better. So, yes, you want an, a Roth IRA, but what should you have in that Roth IRA? Well, you should, as again, consider that as just one receptacle. You may also have money that isn't in the Roth IRA simply because the Roth IRA can only take so much money per year, and you've got more money than that available to you, not necessarily each year, but already saved up from the past. And you need to look at the entire situation that you have. How much money do you have all together? I think that you should have what I call a permanent portfolio, where you have the money divided equally between stocks, bonds, gold, and cash. And I won't run through all the reasons for that again now, because we've covered them many times, and I'm sure we'll be covering the, those reasons many times again in the future. But the point being that, if you're going to have this kind of diversified portfolio, the question of the IRA is which would be the best of those investments to hold in the IRA and which would be the best ones to hold outside the IRA. Well, definitely you want to put in the IRA the ones that would otherwise have the worst tax consequences, and that generally means the ones producing interest. If you're going to have bonds in there in your portfolio, then they would be the first thing you'd want to stick in that IRA because that way the interest would accumulate tax-free and you wouldn't have to pay taxes on it until you, the time you retire, at which time you would probably pay at a much lower tax rate than you're paying today, or we would hope so if taxes don't continue to go up indefinitely. Uh, so bonds would be the first thing you'd want to put in there. Well, suppose you still have more room left in the IRA. Well, then I'd put the treasury bills in, the, the cash portion of the portfolio, because it's also earning interest. Well, suppose you still have more room, then I'd start putting the stocks in, uh, the stock mutual funds or however you're holding the stocks. I prefer having S&P 500 index funds, uh, but they will be paying dividends, so put them in there too. 
gold and stocks will have capital gains, but capital gains are taxed at a lower rate, and so I would be putting the items in the IRA or any other tax-deferred account. I'd be putting in the items that are would otherwise have to pay taxes at normal tax rates, which could be anywhere up into the 30s of percent, whereas the long-term capital gains are just 15%. So that takes care of the question about the IRA. Now the next question is, should you be investing in gold? Obviously, I think you should have gold in the portfolio, but I don't think you should go hog wild over gold simply because you heard somebody say that gold was ready to jump up to in price and that uh, inflation was coming back and uh, because of the fall of the, of the dollar and this, that, and the other thing, gold's ready to go wild, so load up on gold. No, just simply have 25% in gold, and if gold does go up, that 25% in gold will be powerful enough that it will carry the entire portfolio upward, even if the other investments aren't doing well. Daryl goes on this question to say, I know the stock market isn't doing well. No, it isn't doing well. But for all I know, it might spring to life tomorrow morning. I don't expect it to, but I can't predict the future, and neither can you, Daryl, and neither can anyone else listening to this broadcast. Neither can anyone who has a radio show on investing. Neither can anyone who writes a newsletter or books on investing. There's no one who can predict the future. And just when we think that something is inevitable, it doesn't happen. And just when we think something can't happen, it does happen. The last question, our dollar is very, very weak. And I'm glad you brought this up because this is an important question uh, about the dollar. People keep talking about the falling dollar and how you must protect yourself against it and so on. But the dollar is falling in international exchange, and that really does not concern you. It is not a problem that the dollar is falling. Yes, it is making some foreign products more expensive than they would be otherwise. And yes, it would be nice if that weren't the case. And so if you were making money from the falling dollar, you might offset that. But the fact of the matter is that that's not really a terribly important consideration. What is important about the dollar is when inflation starts hitting the United States and you have an inflation rate of 5, 7, 10%, then, of course, you have a real problem with a weakening dollar, and you need to have protection against that. But the fact that the dollar is falling against the euro, the fact that the dollar is falling against the yen, the fact that the dollar is falling against the Swiss franc or the Chinese, uh, well, it isn't falling against Chinese currency because that's pegged. But the fact that it's falling against these other currencies is not really a matter of concern unless you're involved in international trade or you have international investments of various kinds. Otherwise, for the average Joe, you and me, it is not an important consideration. So just close your little ears when you hear somebody talking about the falling dollar and that's uh, implying that there's some investment uh uh, some investment tack that you must take right now before it hurts you too badly because it isn't going to hurt you too badly so don't worry about it all right we have a couple of more segments to go so don't go away this is harry brown phone number is 1-800-259-9231 we will be right back Welcome back. Harry Brown here, and this is The Money Show, brought to you in part by the Permanent Portfolio Family of Funds. And we have a question from Tom in Colorado. I should say again that my email facilities are not available today, so you can't email me a question. But I did get some emailed questions during this past week, and those are the questions that I'm going over on the show today. Tom in Colorado says, on your March 6th program, you spoke highly of one exchange-traded fund, ETF fund, as they're called, as being suitable for the bond portion of your permanent portfolio. This fund was the iShares Lehman 20-plus year Treasury Bond Fund, which is traded on the Amex with a 
ticker symbol of TLT. Let me interrupt there just to say that I said that uh, it's obviously best if you buy bonds directly yourself, either from a broker or some commercial banks that sell treasury bonds. But if for any reason you can't because the amount of money you have available uh, doesn't warrant buying $1,000 bonds or higher, that you can invest in this uh, mutual fund, which just came on the market uh, a few months ago and was a welcome development because for years I had searched for such a bond fund that invested only in long-term treasury bonds and no such fund existed, and so I'm glad that one's available now. Tom asks, I'm wondering if an ETF fund might also work for the gold portion of the permanent portfolio. One is N on the NYSE, GLD is the ticker symbol, Street Tracks Gold Shares, and another is iShares Comex Gold Trust, which is IAU on the Amex Exchange. It says both own gold bullion and seek to correspond to the day-to-day -day movement of the price of gold bullion. Well, he goes on to anticipate my answer where he says, I know you prefer direct ownership of gold. And I do. I definitely think that the direct ownership of anything is better because it just cuts out one more variable, one more thing that might go wrong over a period of time. So obviously I do prefer the direct ownership of gold. And gold is especially important to be owned directly because of the fact that it is something that you would be relying on if things really were in bad shape where a lot of companies were going down the drain. But Tom says, and in my case, all my funds are in an IRA, so I can't just buy bullion coins. Well, that's not exactly uh, precise, Tom. You can buy bullion coins. You just cannot take possession of them if they're in an IRA. In an IRA, they have to stay with a custodian, so you don't have them in your own possession. And it would be nicer if you could uh, take the bullion coins and put them in a safe deposit box. So he says, do you think a gold ETF might be at all suitable for my permanent portfolio? Well, I would prefer that you instead uh, use the IRA to buy gold coins and let the custodian keep the gold coins. Again, you're cutting out one variable there, and that is the uh, company that may or may not uh, correspond directly to the gold price with the price of their gold shares. So I think I would prefer to, that you stick with the bullion coins. And, of course, for those who don't know, a bullion coin is a coin that has no rarity value whatsoever, no numismatic value, so it corresponds directly to the price of gold. Such coins are the American Eagle Gold coins that are produced by the U.S. Treasury, the Canadian Maple Leaf coins that are produced by the Canadian Treasury, uh, South African Kruger Rands, Austrian Philharmonics. All of these are one-ounce coins and, in some cases, fractions of ounces that have very low premiums on them. On a one-ounce coin, the premium should be 3 to 5%. That means if the price of gold is $400 today, you will pay about 412 to $420 for the one-ounce coin. And the additional money that you pay, the premium, is what you're paying for the packaging. The fact that it's right there in one ounce and anybody knows it's one ounce, doesn't have to be assayed and so on. And you usually get that premium back when you sell the coin to somebody in the future. So uh, I would prefer the uh, bullion coins. And I would also suggest that the first money that you can lay your hands on outside of an IRA in the future, that you use that to buy some gold coins that you can put in a safe deposit box. You don't want to take direct uh, uh, ownership or don't need to of the bonds or the treasury bills and the mutual funds, of course, you're dealing directly with the mutual fund. But gold is something you would like to have in your own hands. Tom has a second question on a different note. He says, I find it most distasteful to lend money to our government, which continues to grow out of control. The permanent portfolio indeed asked me to invest half of my lifetime savings with the government, meaning the bond and the cash portions. This could, this could be a showstopper for me. 
Is there a small government version of the permanent portfolio that does not rely on government investments? Well, I understand your feeling about that. And if you just are ideologically opposed to the idea of, of lending any money to the U.S. government, then what I would suggest is that you pick a bunch of high-grade corporate bonds and uh, make a selection of them, but be sure to have at least three different bonds there, and you will have to monitor those over time. That's the advantage of the Treasury bonds is you don't have to monitor them. We'll be right back right after these words. This is Harry Brown. This is Harry Brown. Have you lost money in stocks over the past few years? From 2000 through 2002, the stock market lost a third of its value. But during those three years, a bulletproof portfolio gained 9%. And over the past 34 years, such a portfolio gained an average of over 9% per year throughout periods of prosperity, inflation, and recession with no wide swings in value. My book, Failsafe Investing, shows how you can have that kind of portfolio for yourself. And now you can download the book for only $9.75. You don't have to rely on alleged market wizards or stay up late worrying about your savings. Failsafe Investing will show you how to have the security that you crave. Go to libertyfree.com to see a sample chapter of Failsafe Investing and then start protecting the savings you've worked so hard to acquire. That's libertyfree.com. Welcome back, and before we go any further, I want to thank you so much for tuning in today to The Money Show, and I want to thank John Harmon for taking care of everything in Minnesota so that we didn't fall off the air at any point during the past hour, and I want to thank the sponsors of this show for making it possible that we can do this every Sunday afternoon, and in particular, the Permanent Portfolio Family of Funds, which is seeking safety and stability for all of its shareholders by uh, having a balanced and diversified portfolio. Well, we've covered a lot of questions today, and there's one final thought I'd like to leave you with, and that is that it's very, very easy to feel guilty about your savings and your investments, to feel that you're not putting in enough time studying and examining and uh, searching for different things. And one of the advantages of having a permanent portfolio is once you set up the portfolio, you can pretty well forget about it, and you no longer feel like you're not reading enough newsletters, you're not reading enough books, you're not going to enough seminars, you're not listening to enough programs like this, or whatever it may be. But there's a further point that's involved here, too, and that is that you are a human being, and you're put here on earth to enjoy your life and to try to make the most of it. And of course, you want to be concerned about the future. You never want to sacrifice the future for the present, but you also don't want to sacrifice the present for the future because you don't know how much of a future there will be. And what I'm saying is that you should go easy on yourself. If you see you've made a mistake, accept it. All right, I made a mistake. I'm only human. And I will try not to make that mistake in the future, and I'll try not to make other mistakes in the future. But I know that I'm bound to make some mistakes here and there with my investments or as with any part of my life. So I should not berate myself unduly for this. And we always want to try to do our best, and that's what I believe we should do. You should try to do your best. But you should aim high just to make absolutely sure that what you do actually succeed at doing is going to be good enough to make a difference in your life. I've already decided that the epitaph that should be on my gravestone should read something like this. I did not become everything I wanted to be. I did not achieve everything I wanted to do. But because I aimed for the stars, I did reach the top of the world. And that's my advice to anyone, is to try to do your best, but don't kick yourself 
when it doesn't turn out to be exactly what you had hoped for because we're not going to get everything that we want in life. But if we try to do our best, then what we're going to do is going to be good enough to be able to enjoy our lives. And we should enjoy that half full glass to the fullest and not worry about the half that isn't full. Well, that's all I've got to say for today. But I hope you come back next Sunday because we're going to do this again and we'll have new questions and we'll have new things to talk about. And I look forward to talking with you then. This is Harry Brown. I hope you have a very good week. But don't forget to come back. Come back, you hear?